In this episode, I chat with Verid Frank. She is the head of marketing at Seeds Investor, which is a wealth tech platform that basically helps financial advisors leverage technology tools to be more engaging with investors and create more personalization in the entire experience of portfolio management and all of that good stuff. In this episode, Verit and I get into her background at a traditional financial institution and how some of those learnings have transferred into her roles in different fintech companies. We talk about the importance of user experiences and how we have to transform our industries and leverage technology to be able to create more engaging experiences for people. And we also talk about the importance of elevating women in the fintech space when Verit was entering the space, she felt a lot of sense of belonging from women like Michelle Tran, who influenced her to stay in the industry and join in. And she shares some pieces of advice for other women that are looking to break into the fintech or wealth tech space. So I hope you enjoy this conversation with Verid Frank. Verid, thank you so much for joining me on Humans of Fintech. I'm so excited to have you on the show and to dive into all of the twists and turns that have been your career in finance, fintech, wealth tech. Yeah, thanks so much for having me, Nicole. I'm, I'm really excited for us to chat. Yes, okay. Well, I think the TLDR on your career path since uh, our, our prep call together was that you, you, know, you grew up in traditional financial services, largely at Schwab, Charles Schwab. You went and founded a B2C fintech platform, and then you went back to Schwab and served as their CMO for Charles Schwab Bank. And fast forward a little bit more, you are now a CMO at a wealth tech company, and so you're back at fintech. So you have gone traditional finance, fintech, back to traditional finance, and then fintech. What a part of that whole journey like stands out the most to you? Yeah, I would say I spent a big chunk of my career, it feels like, interested in fintech, looking to see what made the most sense for for me and what I was looking to do. And I would say it was a hard journey to make that um, that pivot, that shift. And I imagine there are a lot of other listeners who are feeling the same way, and, and we can talk more about the details. But Making the migration from traditional financial services to fintech is um, a path that not many people take, um, but at the same time, it's been incredibly rewarding because the experience I have gained from both sides of the table, even though I don't like to think that way necessarily, um, has been invaluable. And I just feel at this point in my career, um, it's just really empowered me to make good decisions and really be able to accelerate growth, um, both at startups as well as larger organizations. Yeah. I mean, I'd love to get into into that, right? Into that, um, almost that necessity, right? Where you have the background of working at traditional finance, which has that structure, right? It has that organization. Complete opposite out of fintech startup, right? Like a fintech startup is like, I hope you're ready to run with the wolves. <laughs> like I hope right. I hope you're ready, but those are also skills that you need in in a career. So I mean talk us through maybe what are some of the bigger learnings in the traditional finance realm and then maybe we can talk about like the fintech and how that crossed over or didn't cross over. Yeah. So, you know, it's interesting looking back at my career especially in traditional financial services and and perhaps I was lucky because I I mostly spent my time at Charles Schwab when it came to the larger brokerages, but I worked with incredibly talented people. And so I think there's a little bit, unfortunately, of a misconception around who's working at these legacy financial services companies and who's working at the fintechs. And there's a little bit of that FOMO where you feel, oh, I'm not working with the smartest and the brightest because I'm not at these um, fintechs that were often started by some of the smartest and the brightest out there for sure. And so I'd say when I look back, the foundation that I developed at Schwab was came from people who had been in the industry a long time, um, but also had careers before they joined financial services. So I think about um, the SVP that I worked with on the marketing side, she came from CPG background, consumer product um, mm-hmm. 
background. And she was at, um, I believe, I think it was PG, Procter and Gamble, which was known to really instill in people a pretty robust foundation around consumer product marketing. Uh, another example was a, a leader that I worked with came from McKinsey. There are actually a lot of ex McKinsey um, leaders at Schwab. And again, what, what this gives people is really kind of frameworks and solid foundations that they can then apply no matter what the scenario. And I think that's some of the value that you get from some of these larger organizations, especially if you're working organizations organizations that have brought in talent, um, that have really learned these foundational frameworks, because then you can go to a startup, like I said, you can go to kind of any environment and you've got a foundation to work with. I find that sometimes when you're at a startup and you don't have some of that background in place, it is easy to struggle, yeah. unfortunately. And it is that much harder because there's no structure. You have to develop it. But if you've never done that before, or you don't have some of those frameworks in mind as you're looking to develop it, um, it, it you can be at a real disadvantage. Mm. Yeah, I think that's, you know, as I, even working for a startup myself, just seeing, you know, it's so fun and also crazy for me to see some of the, you know, fresh out of college coming and working um, you know, at the, my media startup. And I'm like, Wow, can't imagine like can't imagine what it's like to just like jump so deep in, right? And also have so much responsibility and it be so fast paced and all of the things right away, right? And in a way I'm you know, I am envious because it's such a cool gig to have right after school. But I'm also then on the other side really grateful that I did, I guess, you know, despite whatever work traumas, <laughs> work in more traditional corporate America structures because it did lay this foundation that almost for me has accelerated being able to work at a startup. Like the reason I'm able to manage all of the different tasks and wear the hats or do all the things I have to do in a startup is because I have that, I know how to organize myself because I once had managers or you know editors and stuff that kind of made me that way is that kind of what like experience you feel like you had and that maybe translates you know into working at a fintech startup too that that's exactly it right so so if, you, if you've never seen it happen before and i find this again and again especially when i work with um founders who are earlier in their careers or, or people that are working at Findex or earlier in their careers, if you've never seen it before, you, you don't know what it looks like. And I would say even, even when you try to explain it, it it's hard to, to help people understand, well, here are the steps that you go through and here's why. Uh, and I would say sometimes people have a visceral reaction when you talk about processes. So um, like I said, I've, I've kind of, um, I've met with so many FinTech companies. I've interviewed with them. I've met with them from a consultative basis. And sometimes I, I've been in conversations where I talk about these things and people look at me and the feedback is, you know, she's too process oriented. Um, and again, I think that's that's a natural reaction from someone who, to your point, is starting in the startup world, right? They're, they're going to it because they have this impression of what um, large organizations look like and, they, and they're not attracted to that. But at the same time, it's sort of, no, there, there's sort of an appreciation of, of someone who can bring in some of those processes and help you learn and grow. Process is not always a bad word. And I think sometimes um, startups do have a visceral reaction to that. And, um, you know, they, they don't they don't want to have all that red tape and that yeah. um, the extra steps. And I think it's about finding the right balance, right? Yeah. It, I don't think you have to over process things, but I think it's good to say, all right, kind of these are the, the main components we want to think about. Um, and then there's a lot of free form of, of how you execute against them, right? It's not that every task behind those things is is sort of predefined. And I think that's what makes startups really exciting um, versus coming from a traditional firm. If you're working on a legacy product or a legacy team in a traditional firm, everything's sort of laid out, right? So when, mm. you know, when you join that company, people often say, here's how we do things. And again, this, the startups are really trying to break that. So I appreciate both sides. And I think it's just being knowing how to blend the two together in a way that actually really drives growth and the successful fintech startups that that's what they've done mm. right they've brought that that balance and that blend um, and they're able to execute in a way that that makes sense and there's some discipline behind yeah well at the end of the day you know too much of anything is not the answer right you always, everything <laughs> right. has to have a balance um, you know in and, and I think one of my main critiques, if you will, of the fintech space is that, um, you know, we have been very, very good at go, go, go. We've been very good at, you know, get as much capital as possible, get as much attention as possible, get as like, and, and hyper-focusing on some of those elements. And that's fine, but, 
you know, we do still need, right? Like, especially in a product, you know, realm or even a market, like in any realm, really. But I know you're obsessed with like product and, um, but that like, yeah, you should have processes in place, not only just to make sure that you're building the best product possible, but also to make sure that like your employees are set up for success as well. Yep. A hundred percent. Yeah. And I think, I think a good example, though it might be an extreme example. Um, so I follow Matt Levine. Uh, I, I imagine you're familiar with him. So he writes a lot about what's taking place in the financial services industry. Um, and he's had, and he's pretty, he's pretty verbose uh, and snarky and um, <laughs> sarcastic. So, but I really appreciate some of the um, content he's written around FTX and, and everything that's going mm-hmm. on there. And I would say, to me, one of the things that exemplifies what we're talking about is he had one piece that spoke about the fact that they brought in um, the person who was brought in to clean up Enron. Um, that same person was brought in now to, to sort of understand what's going on with FTX. Um, and that person was was baffled by the craziness and how bad it was. And I would say, um, again, the examples he's given, right? So, so you look at kind of the Enron case, which is sort of the the traditional financial services doing bad stuff. And then you look at the FTX case, which is a startup doing bad stuff. And in both cases, um, they're doing really bad stuff. But what's amazing is is sort of the way in which they're doing it. Um, I think Enron was much more disciplined in their approach even. So <laughs> when he went in there to see what had happened, it was sort of very clear what took place, not just at a high level, but mm-hmm. but at every level. Again, these aren't positive stories. <laughs> um, but when he talks about, um, you know, again, Matt, Matt Levine talking about sort of what this, um, I wish I could remember his name, the person who was coming in, when he was looking at FDX, he couldn't even make sense of the chaos. Right? So it was very clear that mm-hmm. there was deliberate, um, I shouldn't put words, um, it seems like there was deliberate um, Allegedly. fraud. I'll, I'll help you. Alleged. There was alleged. Thank you. Alleged <laughs> deliberate fraud. Um, that being said, there's so much chaos behind it that he yeah. can't even dismantle what was taking place. So, so I think that's a good. I don't know if that's a good example, but that's sort of an example of how this manifests in in a, in a yeah. way that perhaps people can say, "Oh yeah, okay, I can see the difference between the two. Yeah, like have process in, is in place so that at least if you are frauding people, it can be more clear. <laughs> no, 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 no. That is not the message you're. Not, not no, the no, best no. example. But, um, no, but no, no, no. It was like, but yeah. it's one that grabs people's attention, right? and is important so um but i think that you know obviously in those situations those people had um you know there were bad actors if you will that's like what the fraud place likes to call them um there were there was bad intention there right yes now if you're a company with right with good intention however um you should want all of the things that come with having a little bit more structure or patience or empathy or, you know, following of intuition, maybe like taking a step back and saying, okay, what is it that we're really going to do and be intentional so that you can create a positive impact. And that's for me, like one of the um, big things I would like to see more of in the fintech and well, well, tech slightly different, but fintech space mostly. Um, yeah, is just like a little bit more, okay, like who are we really trying to serve? What are we really trying to do? There's an emphasis on communities. What com- community can I really serve so that I'm fulfilling the mission of fintech creating access to the financial system, right? Like how do I actually... Yeah. Um, but it's funny because then on the wealth tech side, they almost that's like a some somewhat of a different story. I think that there needs to be a little they could be like a little faster, but it's more so of a more of a financial advisors needing to realize that like personalization and community are even a worthwhile thing to be paying attention to for their businesses. And I feel yes. like that's what you help solve. Yes. So so that is exactly the yeah. area that I'm most passionate about. So um, I'm now leading marketing for Seeds Investor, and we have a vision of a world where people's money and meeting are aligned. And that's really important to us. So when we talk about investment personalization, that's what we're really striving for. So it's interesting because fintech's a big space. And so mm-hmm. I, I do focus primarily on wealth tech. But if you think about the payment space has been really focused on uh, reducing barriers, um, reducing friction. And it's interesting because to some extent, a lot of that innovation has has actually a little bit disconnected people from their money in an interesting way, right? So you think, you know, you can pay with everything with a click in the button. 
you know, I think about it, it takes me months to earn what I spend with a click in the button. And, and that's a lot of that has been enabled by fintech innovation. Mm. And it's sort of, you know, kind of take a step back and you think, hmm, interesting. On the wealth tech side, that innovation hasn't necessarily been driven by fintech. It's been driven by financial product innovation. So we've moved from having individual stock picking to having mutual funds and then actually having index funds, which again, are incredible, um, are incredibly value for people who want to invest, who historically could not invest in a diversified way. But when you invest now in these ETFs, you're somewhat disconnected from what that means. Mm -hmm. Um, So it's really removed a lot of that meaning and that um, feeling of, I understand where my money is going. And with that comes a a lot of apathy. And we believe truly, and, and this is something that I felt a long time, empowering people to have that connection actually creates better outcomes. And Mm -hmm. we're not saying that everyone should care about investments. Everyone should be watching the stock market. That's not what this is about. But this is actually about understanding where your investments are going, your 401k investments. And if you don't necessarily care about where they're going, that's fine. But again, making, making that decision. And today, the default is really creating that separation between your investments and what's happening with them, right? You sort of hand them over Mm -hmm. to either your 401k plan at your company, or you hand them over to your financial advisor. And there's, there's really not an experience to bring you along in the journey in a way that matches what you care about. Mm -hmm. I feel like this is what makes you so uniquely positioned to be the person to create the process and structure around a user experience where this is something they're actually interested in, right? Like understanding the experience of, oh, that's what's happening to my portfolio or that's what my financial advisor is doing. Do you think that some of the lessons learned from your time at Schwab, where maybe there was more red tape and all of those process things that we've been talking about, that you are able to apply to help seed reach this goal that we're, you know, in this this kind of evolution that we're talking about with personalization? Yeah. So the, the, the part in my career journey that I think has really helped me be the, the best suited for, for the position I'm doing right now is really a, a couple of things. So one, it's an appreciation of the value that financial advisors deliver. So I was watching all the innovation taking place with Betterment and Wealthfront, and I I really love to see um, everything that was happening there. And I I know you've interviewed um, people from from both of those companies. What's really interesting is they really focused on the experience. Mm -hmm. So the the investment product wasn't a new product. I'm I'm probably getting more details here, but the investment product is called a separately managed account. That that investment vehicle has been around for a long time. What Wealthfront and Betterment um, really cracked open was the experience around that. Mm -hmm. Um, But at the same time, they approached it in a very technical way. So Wealthfront really prided themselves on their positioning that we are we are technology for people from the tech sector, right? And it's sort of, I, I never understood why they positioned themselves that way initially, but that was um, really what they pride themselves on. And it sort of, um, while I was at Schwab seeing all this unfold, I realized that you you can't take the, the financial advisor out of the picture. There is a mm-hmm. value that they deliver um, and technology can help enable it. At the same time, financial advisors are delivering an experience that's pretty antiquated, right? And and this is um, particularly the case for women. Yeah. Um, you know, you meet with a financial advisor, you go through a financial plan. More often than not, that experience falls short. Uh, I was working with someone for a while. Uh, we were trying to think about uh, launching a new product, and she's like, "Oh, I just met with my financial advisor, and it was just the worst experience ever." Right? You go through a retirement plan, and yeah, it's not pretty great. sure the stats like people would rather go to like. The dentist or whatever then hang out and like right. go to their so, so financial really, advisor that's a really popular stat at the same time people also say they really want financial advisors so it's really interesting look there, there's so many surveys out there in this space and, and you can pick which one mm-hmm. y- you want to use but there are a lot of surveys that talk about millennials 
um, feeling more confident with financial advisors. And it could just be that they actually have a Betterment account and they're leveraging the service that Betterment offers now where you can actually speak to someone. Uh, anytime I hear someone talk about a financial advisor and because there's so many different forms, I think at the end of the day, they're, they're having a conversation with someone live. Uh, and that goes a long way. That that builds confidence, that builds reassurance. Mm-hmm. It's incredibly valuable. I keep saying that as, as we think ahead of, of what's going to happen, I, I do envision a, a scenario where we're able to replicate the value of financial advisor using using AI technology, but it's still going to be a person. It's not a chatbot, mm-hmm. right? So um, that's another story for another discussion. <laughs> but that's really what I learned from at Schwab, right? So I was, I was paying attention to the innovation technology, but but really looking at what it meant, right? So I think you see all these trends and it's really important to understand what's driving that trend. So I think a lot of people saw the trend in robo-advisors and sort of the immediate takeaway was people don't want financial advisors and that's why they love this and it's easier and it's cheaper. And a lot of those elements were true, but I think again, what made that technology so powerful was that it was creating a new experience by which people could invest. Mm-hmm. And that made all the difference. Um, you know, same thing with Robinhood. It wasn't like online brokerages did not exist, right? right. Um, but they yeah. created an experience that was more engaging. And so for me, um, when it comes to wealth tech, it's all about the experience that you're building, um, much more so necessarily than the investments you're delivering at the end, because there's no shortage of investment products. I've worked on them. I've launched them. I, I'm part of that, that problem, yeah. one would say. <laughs> um, but at this point, there. it's really about, yeah, I've been there. But it's about creating, um, it's about creating that experience. And that's where technology can be, um, can really just be a game changer. Yeah. Well, it's, you know, technology, the whole point of fintech and the tech part is technology to make a financial experience less crappy, right? Less, less, right. Um, <laughs> right? less like going to the dentist and getting, you know, a tooth pulled or whatever you don't like about the dentist. Um, and, you know, I think that experience element has been such a, um, sometimes a difficult thing to get into the minds of the financial advisor, right? Because they're, they are, they come from and, you know, a, a career, you know, they chose a career where that is not like you were not trying. I mean, it's not my job to focus on experience. It's not my job. Right. To fo- it's my job to make you as much money as possible. Right. And it's like, oop, wrong. Maybe that once was it, but we are in a different phase of world now where yeah. people, they like what you said, they don't just want to hear from you how great my money train is going because of whatever you've done to my portfolio. They want to know how you're doing it and why you're doing it. And they want like, yeah, they just want that full scope because the people now are so interested in education and understanding and transparency, right? So they want that. They want to know. Um, So it's like, how are you going to deliver that in a way that, you know, isn't, a text message from my financial advisor or a phone call or whatever, right? How do you use technology to deliver that in, you know, that, that, uh, personalized way, especially a way that is that the user or the end client, right? Feels like you understand me. And that's the huge part, especially women, especially diverse communities. They want to know, like, I can trust you with my money because you understand me. Right, right. And traditionally, so much of that experience that the advisor delivered when they would try to get to know their their clients better was a pretty manual experience, right? It was was sort of they would have a conversation, they would take notes, they would write them down, and then they would sort of have to decipher what those notes meant and how it would translate to how they should speak to this client going forward. But it was all manual. It's all automated. And look, advisors, I mean, I'm not good at always translating what someone says to me to, you know, how do I now act? And that's, again, um, especially at Seeds, what we're focused on is creating the software for each step of that process. And so the advisor is still collecting that information, but they're doing it in a digital way. And then when we ingest that information, we're doing it, again, using a little more of an analytical approach, data-driven um, mm-hmm. understanding. All right, if, you, if you're if you gathering these inputs from someone, more often than not, these inputs mean that this person cares about X, Y, and Z, right? So yeah. so that's where the, the technology comes in and the automation. Yeah. But again, it's, it's changing people's behavior, mostly for the advisor, right? The, the end client, um, especially to your point, um, 
the new generation of investors, women, um, people who haven't had access to wealth management, historically younger investors, they're all looking for that experience. Now we got to make sure that it's getting delivered on the front end. It's, it's sort of they're clamoring for it. And it comes it gets translated in sort of different ways, unfortunately. So it gets translated interest in ESG and interest in these different dynamics. Yeah. And again, at the end of the day, what it's really saying is I want you to interact with me differently. And advisors don't necessarily have the confidence to do so, to, to my point, right? Because they're writing these things down um, and they don't always feel confident of what do I do with this information? Mm. How do I now relay it back? How do I use it to to run my relationship for lack of a better description? Yeah. Yeah. It's like so crazy to me when people think that like fintech is dead. That's just like headlines. Yeah, I know. Right. It's like comical. Let's all laugh. Ha 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 ha. A collective laugh. Um, because li- listen to everything that you just said. Right. Like I think that the wealth tech space, the sliver of wealth tech that is, you know, in, in the fintech um, industry is, has so much white space. There's still so much work left to do. We've really just scratched the surface on what we can provide, right? And and the accessibility, right? And the experiences and all of that good stuff. And I think, you know, what a cool position you are in, right? With all of your past knowledge to be able to almost like speak to the the, you know, audience in a way that you are after, right? Like the financial advisor to be like, hey, look, I've seen it been done one way. Let me let me bring you in into this other way, which is the, you know, the way that will help you, you know, build the best business possible. I mean, when it comes to seed investor where you're at now, was there like a moment or something about the company that made you feel like this is where I belong? FinTech is it? <laughs> so I felt like I belonged in fintech for a long time. It's interesting. Uh, even though my husband always questions me, he's like, are you sure you enjoy it? And it's just that you know it so well. Um, <laughs> so, so fintech in particular has, has felt like my uh, my sweet spot. And that's kind of why I, I keep going back and forth is um, when I actually you know, spoke about like, how, how did I break into fintech? So when I went to Schwab um, the second time around, I sort of, I did it because I really want to hone into my product marketing skills, right? So I, before that was more of a products um, focus, but it was investment products. I had done other aspects of product distribution. I'd done marketing, but it wasn't, um, I didn't spend uh, the majority of my time devoted to understanding product marketing and how it can be implemented at a legacy institution. And so um, that was why I went back to Schwab to really hone in on those skills. But I always knew I was going to go back to FinTech, right? So um, it was sort of, all right, in order to really add value to any company that I join, I want to have this expertise. Since then, um, this is my third um, you know, full-time FinTech. I've done a lot of consulting. I, I've also known that WealthTech was my space. So mm-hmm. you know, it's interesting you talk about kind of um, FinTech is dead. And and I think, again, it's a, it's a big space with lots of different verticals. And um, WellTech is one that that is actually really early on, right? It, it's actually one that people, you know, when I was looking for fintech roles in WellTech, I couldn't find them. Um, th- there weren't that many companies. Um, that's kind of why it's, you know, I, I thought about starting my own company. But, you know, at this point, people are sort of appreciating, like you were saying, that there there's a value here to deliver this experience. Financial advisors aren't going away. How do we use technology to accelerate it? When I met um, Zach Conway, who's the founder and CEO of Seeds Investor, I really connected with him because here was someone who had worked as a financial advisor himself and had seen firsthand what the challenges were and had built this MVP Mm -hmm. that he really felt passionate about. And so everything was aligned from that perspective in terms of industry understanding, um, deep empathy for advisors, but at the same time, to your point, an appreciation that something needs to change. And so I, I was coming from um, the, the brokerage side, see, seeing all of that play out. He mm-hmm. was actually an independent advisor seeing that play out. So we had a lot of overlap in terms of our beliefs of where the industry was going and an understanding of the steps to, to start moving it in that direction. Yeah. Oh, so cool. I mean, and it takes that type of background sometimes, right? And empathy to actually, you know, create um, the the solutions, right? And also to fully understand. At the end of the day, if your, you know, leadership at your company isn't reflective of the audience that you're trying to serve, then it's going to be a uphill 
battle. Uh, it'll be a big challenge, yeah. right? To, to reach, uh, levels of success, right? That you want. And that's a huge reason why, you know, I like to dive into, um, all of these elements of, of the humans of fintech and in this case, almost wealth tech. Um, I want to ask you one of my favorite questions on the show, which is if we need to be the change that we want to see, what change do you wish to see in, I'll make it wealth tech for you, in wealth tech <laughs> and how do you embody it? So I, I think wealth tech still suffers from what a lot of other fintech um, spaces suffer from, which is a lack of um, female and um, diverse representation. And so that that's really a challenge because as we're looking to create these improved experiences, I still worry that um, they have a, a bias to them, a tilt mm -hmm. to them, because there isn't necessarily an appreciation of what, what it takes to really engage with um, someone who's first generation, um, moved to the country, or, you know, family doesn't speak English sort of the, the, the more, um, the less traditional cases in traditional financial services, but again, the new gen investors. And so that's something that's really top of mind to me. And I, I really try to find ways that we can infuse that voice at the table. Um, we're, we're still working on it. We're a small company. Um, yeah. you know, we, so, uh, from, from that perspective, I am representing the female voice. And so, um, I'm really trying to make sure as we think about things that uh, we're really keeping that in mind. And I think I, I am a woman, so I understand mm -hmm. what it takes to engage, but I, I, want us to spend more time thinking about some of those other voices. Um, we are trying to partner where possible with um, other groups that are looking to drive those voices in the industry. So Dana Wilson is a great example. Mm -hmm. um, so she's the founder of CHIP and again, very focused on um, encouraging more um, diversity among advisors. And so we have partnered with her to offer our software um, to the advisors Ooh. on our platform, right? So, That's so again, awesome. looking for that um, ability to empower her to really deliver this value, and at the same time, hoping to get more advisors who represent different backgrounds using our software and and really raising awareness where it's falling short, right? In, yeah. in ways that we just. Um, wouldn't be aware of. So that's one of the things we're, we're trying to do in terms of specifically, but in general, very much top of mind. Um, and we think about a lot uh, in terms of the partnerships that we're, we're doing, the people that we're working with, um, and even the content that we're putting out there, really, really emphasizing why um, not just talking about new gen investors and how they look different and um, there's, they're already here. The, the bigger challenge is the new gen advisors, which uh, mm. it's going to take a little bit longer to nurture and foster, but we're really committed and dedicated to that as well. Yeah. I mean, and I, I love to hear it and it's what the industry so needs and it, you know, it's worth, it's worth it for the long game, right? Like I think sometimes, you know, we're talking about the startup, you know, mentality earlier and you can be that, you think that the path to profitability and thinking of inclusion, right, especially of underrepresented groups and communities, you think those paths are binary. One is sacrificed for the other. And they really are not. <laughs> they do not have to be. In fact, there are many pathways to profitability. We don't need to follow just one single way. And we can do it in different ways. And it does take people like yourself, right? Sitting in your seat to say that and to be aware, right? To be aware that this is the change that I want to see. And this is what, you know, I want us to hyper focus on. And, you know, if you are working, right, you're working with, um, you know, a male founder or CEO or whatever, right? It's like you get to kind of ensure that they're, they have the buy-in for that too, because it does take all of us, you know, this isn't just like a gender siloed issue, right? It's, it's, across the board and, and hurts everyone at the end of the day and stops us from making more money and stops us from doing all the things that we want to do. So it's like, hello, you want to make more money and help the world? Focus on women and underrepresented communities just as much as anybody else. So agree. Yeah, exactly. So happy to see it. I think another really important question I have to ask is what is it like having Adrian from Entourage as a strategic advisor. What does that mean? Have you met yeah. him? 
Um, I've met him briefly, um, but but really just um, a quick interaction. So, you know, it, it's interesting. I, the story behind how Adrian um, found out about Seeds Investor was that um, Zach Conway actually cold LinkedIn messaged him. And it's it's so rare to actually make a connection that what? way. But again, it, 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 I know, I know. And it was, it was a long email. I, I think uh, this was a little bit before I joined the company. I'm sure if I was sitting next to Zach, I would say, no, no, that's too long of an, of an email. <laughs> um, but, but that being said, what really resonated with um, Adrian was the fact that he himself had a financial advisor and his financial advisor was not speaking to him about his values and not connecting with him, right? To your point, the financial advisor is very focused on performance, right? I'm taking your money, I'm doing the most I can do with it. And, um, you know, again, that disconnect, right? Mm -hmm. You give me your money, you tell me kind of what your monetary goals are, and I work towards that, which, which isn't bad, right? So, so th that is still very important. What was missing in that conversation, uh, and what, what Zach brought up in, in the email was the fact that the advisor didn't understand that Adrian cares about a lot of these environmental issues, right? Mm -hmm. And at least having that conversation. And, and again, what I think is really important as we talk about values alignment and personalization is it doesn't mean that the outcome will always look different, but the journey to get to that outcome will. And that makes all the difference. Yeah. And, and that's the connection between money and meaning and, and really breaking down those boundaries. Because today your outcome is ETFs and you don't really feel any connection to that. Tomorrow your outcome might still be ETFs. I'm, I'm just giving an example, exchange traded funds. But you know what names are in those exchange traded funds. You know the stories behind them. You know why you're investing in them. And uh, again, for Adrian, he really um, that sparked a, a light in him that he sort of didn't even know that this this option was available. And that's what really excited him about the company. Uh, and we were really excited to have him on board um, as an investor and and again a, a partner along the way. Yeah. Okay. So cool. Yes. I know. I saw that on the website and I was like, all right, all right. That's like, I got to ask. Um, so cool. I, and I love the, I love the story, right? Because it is centered and, you know, voices like his and, and yours, right? Like there's this amplification of values, which is very much tied uh, into the, you know, the last question, right? Around bringing more women into the space and, and diverse uh, groups because, you know, that is something that is so right, like near and dear to those groups. They have to see that their values are represented, whether, you know, they want to join as, you know, on, on, on the wealth tech side, or they want to be an advisor, or if they want to be a customer, like no matter what see you sit in, you, you want to see your, yourself represented. And if you don't, then that's yeah. what creates all of the different disparities that we see so much of in our wealth management industry. So, but we are, I like to end these things aspirational. So we're working on um, ways to leverage technology, right? To make this, to make it better, to create, have more of those next gen financial advisors, even if it does take a little bit of extra time and patience, better for the industry in the long run. My one of my last questions for you. What is a piece of advice that you would give to any listener of ours, largely other, you know, fintech founders or folks that are, you know, working in fintech, a lot of women. What's your piece of advice for them so that they can feel like this industry is for them and that they belong here too? Yeah, I mean, to me, I I feel like it's it's really important for women in particular not to be afraid of this industry. There are a lot of um, there are a lot of really uh, less less than friendly aspects of this industry historically. Um, and I, I started on the trading floor, right? So I, I sort of understand a lot of that hesitation. I think there's also the feeling of not being interested in numbers, not being interested in math. And and again, I think these are just kind of common sentiments that people feel like there's just a lack of education and awareness about this industry. And I would just encourage people who are excited about helping people with their money, which is I, I can't think of something more motivating and inspirational because pretty much 90% uh, of our worries are grounded in money. And it's it's often 
<laughs> unfortunately, it's often not having enough of it, but a lot of times it's also just not knowing what you don't know. So mm-hmm. my encouragement to people listening to the podcast who are thinking about going into this industry, um, but feel like it's not for them, there is a place for everyone in this space. Like FinTech is so, so wide. Um, I would not be um, put off or scared by anything that you think might be true about this industry. I'd encourage you to speak to those of us who are working in it. Mm-hmm. And, and really, I would say I get so excited about building consumer brands. And this is what a, a lot of this industry is about, right? We're building new consumer brands, we're building new consumer experiences, we're building new consumer products. It really is all about the consumer. And so um, that that's kind of the way I think of it. Yeah, absolutely. And there's so many, you know, you don't need to have a certain degree, you don't need to have a certain background or anything to be a part of this industry. You could be a journalist like me in fintech, you could be, you know, in, in marketing, you could do product design. There's so many elements you could do PR, you know, like our friends that connect us to do this podcast together. I want to make it so exactly. clear, right? And shout so loud that there are so many different opportunities it's probably what i get the most dms from is women especially really only women asking me what do i need to do to enter this industry and you have a good answer there from someone who has not only worked in traditional finance but also a few fintechs at this point um Varid, thank you so much for joining me on the show it has been such a pleasure to talk all things fintech wealth tech where the industry needs disrupting and how we can get more women and diverse voices in the space thank you for being so open and honest with me i appreciate your time thank you for having me this has been so much fun i I could talk to you for hours about this but we will uh, let your listeners uh, get off with with a little less time than that (laughs) there can always be part two you never know yes so thank you thank you again all right woohoo Thank you so much for tuning into this episode. To hear our next story from another diverse leader, be sure to tune in next week. And if you haven't already, be sure to subscribe to our show and give it a five-star rating as it helps our message reach more people who want to find belonging too. Thanks for tuning in.